Hi, it's author Ellie Alexander, and this week on My Favorite Reads, I'm sharing an exclusive first look with you, so stay tuned. I'm so glad to have you here with me today, and I can't wait to share an exclusive first look with you in a minute. But before I dive into that, I wanted to answer a question that has been coming up a lot lately. Many readers have emailed me about what impact the publishing industry is having right now in terms of book sales and delivery and all of that good stuff. As you well know, I don't think there is an industry on the planet or a person who is not being affected by the pandemic that we're experiencing. And the publishing industry, like so many others, is doing whatever they can to try to stay ahead of the curve and keep finding ways to get books out to readers. That is not to negate the fact that there are lots of challenges and issues, but one thing that has changed recently, and I thought this would be interesting to share with you all, is how galleys are delivered. Galleys are also called advanced reader copies. They look like this. They come in paperback form. These release months before a book actually publishes. They are sent to reviewers and librarians and bookstore owners to get them excited about the book and sharing it and perhaps even ordering copies to have on bookshelves everywhere. They often have sales and marketing information on the back and they also are what are called uncorrected proofs. So if you receive a copy like this ever, you will know that there are errors inside of it because it's partially through the publishing stage at this phase. Now, typically what would happen is these lovely little paperback copies would get mailed to bookstores, to libraries, to reviewers. And then a few months later, you'd see the nice hardback copy like this. Well, because printing presses are not running to their normal capacity, there's been a big change. And that is that instead of sending out hard copies like this, everything is going digital. I just learned this last week. So my next book in the Sloan Krauss Mysteries, dun, 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 beautiful drum roll, without a brew. How adorable is this cover? I'm so in love with it. It's the first time we see inside Nitro, and I love this lens looking out into Leavenworth and the village. This is not going to show up in paperback form. It will be sent just as an e-galley out to all of the early readers. And it will be interesting to see if this trend continues after we are out of this crisis. I don't know, but I suspect that it might just because publishing houses are gonna realize it's much more economical to send out just an e-version. So today on this episode, I thought since the advanced reader copy e-version of Without a Brew is due out soon, I would share an exclusive first look with you. I got so many lovely comments about sharing the first chapter of Nothing But Trouble. And this book is due out in October, and I'm gonna read the first chapter with you. This is gonna become a thing, and I told you the last time when we talked about Nothing But Trouble that I don't usually read my stuff aloud, but ah, strange times call for updates for all of us, right? So I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone. So let's dive into Sloane's fourth adventure without a brew. Chapter one. A biting January wind blew into the tap room as the front door to Nitro opened and a group of skiers traipsed inside. They were loaded down with gear, expensive puffy parkas in an array of bright colors, ski goggles, boots, and poles. A slightly overweight guy with a pinched face and an entitled sneer glanced around the bar and scoffed. This is where they sent us, dude. It's gonna be a long weekend. His buddy laughed. We're not in Seattle anymore, Kev. They were followed by two younger women dragging hot pink Prada suitcases behind them. The first guy approached the bar where Garrett, my boss and fellow brewer and I had been pouring pints for locals and brainstorming our spring beer line. In the world of craft beer, we are always thinking a season ahead. Despite the fact that we were deep in the throes of winter in Leavenworth, Washington, we were already dreaming up sunny fruit forward ales and sweet strawberry pilsner. Hey, who do I talk to about getting a couple rooms? The guy with the pinched face interrupted our conversation. He was tall with a slightly receding hairline. I'd put him in his early thirties and judging by his smartwatch with its platinum band and his designer ski gear, I would wager a guess that he worked for one of the many high-tech companies headquartered in nearby Seattle. 
I gave Garrett a look to let him know I had this and turned to the guy. We don't have any rooms. His tightly wound face squeezed even harder. Big blue veins bulged in his forehead. That's not what I heard. I was told you have the only rooms left in town and we want them. We'll pay you cash, hard money, right now. As if to prove his net worth, he dug through a leather wallet and proceeded to flash a bunch of hundred dollar bills in my face. Garrett stepped forward. Who told you we had rooms available? The guy pointed in the direction of Front Street. That cheap ass property management company down the street? I rented a ski chalet from them over the weekend, but apparently the pipes froze and it flooded. That worthless woman tried to rebook us in a hotel, but everything's full. She told us to talk to... He paused for a minute and read a note jotted down on the back of a business card that I recognized. It belonged to my friend Lisa Bombs, who owned a high-end vacation management company in the village. I need to talk to Sloan or Garrett, stat. The name's Kevin Malcolm. You may not be aware, but I'm a VP and I have high expectations when it comes to customer service. He tapped his watch. My friends and I are freezing our butts off out there, so go get one of them for me. <clears throat> You're looking at them, Garrett pointed to his chest. As usual, his slightly disheveled hair was held back with a pair of chemistry goggles that he used when brewing. Great, Kevin clapped twice. Then what do we need to do to get a couple rooms ASAP? He took $500 out of his wallet and proceeded to stack them on the bar one at a time. Technically, we don't have any rooms open, Garrett replied. That was true. If Lisa had sent them our way, she must be in dire straits. We had not advertised the fact that we were about to open a craft beer themed Airbnb. Beer tourism was becoming big business and we were sitting on a little gold mine. We had converted four bedrooms above the brewery into guest rooms in an attempt to pull in another revenue stream in the form of beer travel. We had started renovations in November, but then the holiday season hit and put us behind schedule. Our goal was to officially open next weekend just in time for Leavenworth's annual Bavarian Ice Fest. But we had decided to start with a soft opening in advance of launching our new project. Just yesterday, we had welcomed our first guests a young couple in town celebrating their anniversary. It seemed like a good idea to test the waters before we made the space available to more guests. Look, I don't wanna play games with you, man. Is this a money issue? Consider this a deposit. He nodded to the stack of hundreds. There's plenty more where that came from. I'm willing to fork even more over for a glorified Airbnb because I'm not having my lady sleep out in the cold. He glanced behind him and shot a lewd look at the two women waiting near the front door. I shuddered at his condescending use of ladies. Look, I'm a VP, a VP at a giant tech company in Seattle. You've probably heard of Scream Time. Everyone in the Pacific Northwest had heard of Scream Time. The irreverent ad agency was known for in-your-face ad campaigns that pushed every moral boundary. It was no surprise that Kev worked there. He puffed out his chest and took out a vape pen. I'll make it worth your while to have a stay. I know powerful people in the digital industry. A review from this place for me and you'll get noticed by the jet set. The jet set? Who was this guy? Hey, there's no smoking or vaping in here. Garrett held up a finger to the pompous VP. Lame, he stuffed the vape pen back in his pocket. Give us a minute and we'll see what we can do. Garrett pulled me over to the far corner of the bar. What do you think, Sloan? I shrugged. It's your call. I can get the rooms ready. They're basically done. I just need some linens and towels. I'm sure Lisa must be in a jam if she sent them to us, but remind me to thank her later. I stuck out my tongue. He is a gem. Trust me, I know the type. He's one of 3,000 VPs. We used to call them VPs of ass kissing. Guys like that are the reason I live here now. Garrett had recently moved to our Bavarian utopia after working in Seattle for decades. He had ditched city life to run a nano brewery in the remote northern Cascades. It had been quite a lifestyle change, but one that he was seemingly adapting to. I chuckled. If nothing else, we can take his money. My thoughts exactly. And in some ways, if we can put up with Mr. VP and his pals for the weekend, we'll really have a soft opening. As much as I hate to admit it, we're gonna have to learn how to put up with his type every once in a while. It's not like we can ask people if they're entitled jerks when they make a reservation. 
I don't know, maybe I should form some kind of screen test for that, I said, hopeful that guys like the one waiting impatiently in, at the end of the bar wouldn't choose Nitro's rustic guest rooms. One of the things I liked most about working in the brewery was the low-key vibe and relaxed atmosphere. The space was casual and welcoming, a good spot to savor one of our signature pints in the afternoon. But Garrett raised a fair point. We were about to branch into the hospitality business, and that meant interacting with a variety of customers. I was a professional. I could deal with the VP. Why don't you go back um, over to the bar and tie them over with beers? I'll go check on the guest rooms. I retied my long black ponytail and rolled up the sleeves to my nitro hoodie. What would I do without you, Sloan? Garrett patted my shoulders. shoulder. You're one of a kind. Don't forget it. I winked and left Garrett to deal with the skiers. Nitro was the smallest brewery in the village, with a tasting room and bar in the front, a commercial kitchen, and our brewing operations in the back. It originally belonged to Garrett's great-aunt Tess, who used the space as a diner and guest house. Upstairs, each room had its own bathroom and fireplace. Garrett currently lives in a converted suite. He had taken down the walls between a couple rooms to create his own apartment. The other large suite was occupied by our first employee, Kat. In addition to the apartments and guest rooms, the upstairs included a shared reading room, which we had outfitted with comfy couches, a bookcase stacked with plenty of fiction, along with an assortment of beer titles, and a snack area with a small fridge, with a small fridge, self-serve coffee and tea, and late night munchies. As I walked past the reading room, I spotted Brad and Allie, our first soft opening guests, curled up on the couch. They were leafing through a cross-country trail map and drinking cups of tea. How's everything going? I stopped to check in with them. Brad rested his arm around his wife's shoulder. Good, good, we're mapping out our ski route for this afternoon. When do the lights come on again? The lights that Brad was referring to were Leavenworth's winter showpiece. Over a million twinkle lights adorned every tree and storefront in our German-inspired village. They lit up our little alpine town from the day after Thanksgiving until March, casting a perpetual winter glow on our cobblestone streets. Visitors descend on our otherwise sleepy town every weekend in the winter to experience the magic of the colorful light show and ski and snowshoe in our nearby mountains. Next weekend's Bavarian Ice Fest would include fireworks, ice carving, snow sculptures, and winter games like the penguin shuffle, ice cube scrambling, the snowball toss, smushing, and a local favorite, frisbee sweeping, where contestants sweep a frisbee on a sheet of ice from one end of Front Street to the other. The lights come, after, come on after dusk every night. You'll have plenty of time to hit the trails this afternoon. I looked at the antique cuckoo clock, one of the pieces left from Garrett's Aunt Tess. It was just after one, and the sun wouldn't set until five. I'm glad I found you two. We have some unexpected guests staying, I explained the situation. We weren't intending to book any other rooms, but we can't leave guests out in the cold. Oh, don't give it a thought, Allie rubbed Brad's hand as she spoke. We're happy to share this space, and we're absolutely in love with our room, aren't we, honey? Brad agreed, for sure, the hops theme is awesome, especially the dried hops to put under our pillows. Nice touch. Hops have a naturally calming effect. I often sleep with them at night to help me relax. We decided to offer our guests the same immersive experience by stringing dried hops along the ceiling, placing hop vines in a small mason jar throughout the room, and leaving hop-filled sachets under the pillow. I'm glad you're enjoying it so far. Don't forget to stop in the tasting room and get your free pint later. Additionally, guests who stayed with us would receive special beer tastings, personal brewery tours, and handmade breakfasts. Oh, we're here for the beer, don't worry. We plan to camp out in the tasting room tonight and try everything you have on tap. Allie grinned. I told Brad, maybe we should skip skiing and just go straight for the beer. Brad squeezed her hand. We have the entire weekend for beer, hon. They were clearly celebrating their anniversary. His left arm massaged her shoulder as his right hand was entwined in hers. Their easy show of affection made me think of my soon-to-be ex-husband, Mac. I had caught him cheating with a young barmaid. At the time, I'd been furious, embarrassed, and totally unclear about what to do next. But like with many things in life, sometimes the hardest struggles lead to new discovery. If it hadn't been for Max Strang, I probably wouldn't be at Nitro now at all. 
In some ways, I felt strangely grateful for his infidelity. Not that I condoned it, but we had been unhappy for a while. If I was being honest with myself, I don't think I ever would have left him if it hadn't been for that fateful day when I walked in on him and the beer wench. A part of me would always love him. He had introduced me to the world of craft beer and given me my son Alex. I was hopeful that in the days ahead, we would be able to find a way of being friends or at least co-parents without the baggage that came from decades of an unhealthy marriage. The hardest part of our breakup for me had been the thought of losing my connection with Otto, Ursula, and Hans, Max's parents and brother. They were the only family I had ever known. As the product of a foster care system, I had no baseline for what it was like to have a family support you unconditionally. The Krauses had given me that, and I couldn't bear the thought of losing them. The problem was it wasn't solely Max's infidelity that had put a strain on things with my in-laws. Our relationship was complicated and made more so by Ursula's revelation a few weeks ago that she had known my birth mother. I had been sitting with that knowledge unsure how to proceed. Learning that Ursula had known details about my past and kept them from me had left me feeling completely unsettled. It was made worse by a recent phone call with my former caseworker and only confidant, Sally, who had warned me that Otto and Ursula might not be the sweet couple I had always believed them to be. Was there another reason she had lied to me? Could she have somehow been involved in my parents' disappearance? I shuddered at the thought. Sally was coming in a few days, and until then, my only coping strategy was to keep busy and push any thoughts of the Krauses to the side for the short term. I turned my attention to the happy couple snuggled together on the couch and refocused my thought on the guest room. They even looked alike. Both Brad and Allie had dark hair and deep brown eyes. Allie's was twisted into a messy bun, while Brad's was trimmed and short. Their dewy gaze made me wistful for young love. Enjoy the skiing, and please don't hesitate to let us know if you need anything. We'll look forward to seeing you in the tasting room later. I left them and went to the supply room to get towels, sheets, and toiletries. I planned to put the VP and his friends in the water and yeast rooms, respectively, as both of those had two queen queen beds. They could figure it out from there. I was not going to insert myself into their group dynamic. We had arranged the hop and grain rooms for couples retreats with king beds and clawfoot tubs. If fully booked, Nitro could could accommodate a total of 12 guests. Hopefully that number would bring in some extra cash without inundating us with tons of extra work. The highlight of our brewery lodgings would be custom beer-infused breakfasts. I love to cook, so I had agreed to take on breakfast preparation in addition to the small menu we had for the bar. With a nearly packed house, tomorrow's morning should be a good test. I prepped the rooms and tried to push thoughts of Ursula and my past from my mind. The rooms had turned out better than anticipated. The water room was a sensory retreat with stunning photographs of the Icicle Creek, the Wenatchee River, and Leavenworth snow-capped mountains lining the walls. We had painted the room in soft blue calming tones and adorned it with matching blue and white linens and an indoor water feature. Yeast had been harder to visualize, but Kat, our newest addition, had a stroke of genius when she found a quote about yeast and how every loaf of bread could have tragically become beer. We rolled with that idea by showcasing collections of photos from every step of the brewing process. The yeast room was painted in creamy beige tones with pops of orange and yellow, accent pillows, a small love seat for reading, and a stack of chemistry and science magazines. Once the guest rooms were sparkling clean with fluffy stacks of towels, chocolates on the pillow, and pint glasses ready for filling, I returned to the bar. Garrett was chatting with a local at one of the high top tables. Kat was updating our chalkboard menu with two new guest taps. She was in her early 30s with a mound of curls, dimples, and boundless energy. She had ended up in Leavenworth in a less than fortunate situation, and Garrett and I had taken her under our wing. In exchange for free room and board, she was our girl Friday. Kat might be young, but she was a quick study. She had learned how to pour a perfect pint and was developing her knowledge base for the craft and was always ready to dive in wherever needed, whether that meant washing the dishes or making the beds. I waved to Kat and ducked behind the bar. Okay, 
The rooms are ready, I said to Garrett. Good. He handed me a gold-embossed business card. Kev, a.k.a. Kev Stewart, VP of ass-kissing, and his cronies are all paid up. He looked at Kat. You'll both be happy to know that there's a big, big tip coming our way if he and his friends are happy with our stay. Ugh, gag. Kat stuck out her tongue. If they give you any problems, come talk to me or Garrett. I felt protective of Kat. I know how to deal with guys like Kevin. Do not let them intimidate you. I glanced to the front. Oh, and don't let them smoke. No worries, Kat brushed me off. Those women are like their groupies. They hang on every word Kev says. I don't think he'll mess with me when he's got his vapid fan base drooling all over him. Kat was a bit younger than Kevin and his friends, but she was wise beyond her years. Here's to launching the bed and breakfast. Garrett gave us both high fives. After working on the concept for months, I was excited to kick off our new endeavor. However, I couldn't shake a nagging feeling that Kevin and his friends were going to be trouble. Whew. All right, there you have it. The first chapter of Without a Brew. I will be so eager to hear your comments. Have you read the entire series? Are you new to the Sloan Krause series? Tell me below and as always be sure to subscribe to my channel and click the bell to get notified whenever I share new videos. Happy reading!